Um, so, my name is Ho Ying, um, and I'm an architect. I'm an architect at a practice called ALA, who are based in London. And today I want to talk about um, how we build buildings, but most importantly, how we build buildings and don't build them in isolation. You know, for us it's important that we build buildings that respond and connect to the city or to the environment that is around us. And for me, that means to build responsibly, but also responsively to the city and to the people. And not just people that come to visit these buildings, but also people who come and engage with them, whether it just be walking through them. So I'm going to show some examples which I think exemplifies these in four different settings. The first is a building that we built um, called the Museum of Art and Architecture in Lisbon in Portugal. It's based on the waterfront, right on the edge of the city, but this waterfront edge is completely disconnected from the rest of the city behind it. And it's disconnected because there is this dual carriageway and train line that runs behind the waterfront. And this is what has happened over years of you know, change and because of its industrial heritage that this has come about. So, this building sited on the side of the River Targus. We started off just designing a museum, but actually we went beyond the brief. So this wasn't something that the clients asked for, but we put in a bridge. We wanted part of the design to include a bridge that connected back to the city so that the pedestrians could cross this barrier that was created and be able to come down onto the waterfront. But it was also important for us not just for this bridge to land down on the waterfront edge, but actually for the bridge to land on the roof of the building. So that the roof becomes part of the pathway, becomes part of that piece of infrastructure that then gently brings you down to the waterfront. And here you can see the bridge, and here you can see the roofscape that we've created. But this roofscape, again, um, is not just a pathway, and not just an extension of the bridge but it becomes a piece of landscape. We bring a piece of nature in around to soften the edges so that it creates a place that you don't just meander and walk through and forget about, but it becomes a place where you want to stop, you want to pause, and you want to look across the beautiful view that we've created because of the raised height of the building. But it's a view that you look not just towards the sea, but also back to the city. And so this piece in the middle that we've created suddenly becomes this visual connector connecting you from the city to the waterfront. But it's not just a connector in terms of visual views, but it's a connector for people. And it's here that we bring people to come, to gather, to meet their friends, and in the evening it becomes an outdoor auditorium to watch a movie. And suddenly, because of what we've done here, we've totally enlivened this disused edge of the city, this waterfront edge, which now becomes a gathering place, a place where people are not just along the waterfront, but up on top of the building, admiring the views. And suddenly this area has been completely enlivened. It's completely changed the shape of Lisbon. On the opening day here, 80,000 people turned up. But, you know, these buildings, it's, and the way that we design architecture, it isn't just about these big, grand moves that I've talked about, but it's also about the smaller, finer details that really root the building into its landscape and its surrounding. And if you look here, these are um, ceramic tiles that we've created, these beautiful 3D ceramic tiles that then clad the whole of this sweeping nature of the building. And they're three-dimensional for a reason, the way they can capture the beautiful sunlight that comes from this area. As the sun is setting, it captures this golden dusk light and is reflected across the building. And the building turns from white into this beautiful burnt orange. But we also use this overhanging surface to also reflect light. We're by the river. So the sunlight reflects off the river, bounces off these tiles, and reflects deep down into the basement of the building. And it's in this basement you know, that we have a lot of the art galleries. And it's here that you can look up, see the sky, but you get the reflection 
of the light from the river and you get the slight ripple of the light on the floor. And this gives you this physical connection back and understanding that you're standing by the river even though you're deep within the heart of the building. But sometimes, um, you know, these boundaries and these edges don't necessarily occur at the edge of a city. Sometimes they can occur right in the heart of our city as well. So this is South Kensington. Some of you may know it, where all the museums are. I'm sure you know the Natural History Museum, the Science Museum. The building, or the, the area that has uh, got a red box around it, this is the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this was, again, a competition that we won, you know, many years ago, to design a new entrance and a new 1,000 square metre underground gallery. But the boundary that we have here is the road that's highlighted in blue, Exhibition Road. It's seen as this um, semi-pedestrianised area, really to encourage pedestrians to walk down it. But it's completely disconnected from the V&A. There's no pathway to go in. And so our idea was to break down this boundary, to blur this threshold, to bring the street into the museum and bring the museum out into the street. But we are faced with this. Uh, this is the Henry Cole screen. It's a listed screen. It's been there since the construction of the V&A. And it is this impenetrable wall that's dividing Exhibition Road from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And what is it hiding? Behind it are boiler rooms. Boiler rooms are back of house spaces. And so what we did was we did an absolutely gigantic hole. And we buried the boilers right below this. And on top, we put the new exhibition space, a 1,000 square metre underground gallery, and this beautiful courtyard on top. And then what we did to the screen was we delicately carved out between the pillars and opened up the screen. So you get this view now into the new entrance of the V&A. And so what you feel is, is that the museum is then kind of expressing itself and coming out onto the street. And you are drawn in as a member of the public into this new courtyard. Carvalid is the world's first courtyard, by the way, in porcelain. And it brings you into this new public space, a space where, you know, members of the public can come and gather. They don't have to visit the museum. They can come in here, sit around, have a coffee, see an exhibition, but it's public and open to everyone. And similar to what we did at Lisbon as well, we create this roof light, this oculus, that allows you to look down into the space below and understand that there is something happening below and that you need to go and visit it. And down below, these roof lights that we create begin to flood the circulation spaces with natural light. So you feel uplifted. You don't feel like you're descending down into this gallery. And we use light so it guides us as well. So we're in the gallery space. You can see the pockets of light that's shining towards you, indicating where the entrances and exits are. And when you're in the gallery itself, this oculus, this roof light, brings the natural light down. And you're able to look up, see the buildings beyond, and understand where you are relative to the V&A your belief, the courtyard that you just entered in from. And of course, the courtyard becomes appropriated by the public. The public can come there, have parties, and bring this piece of London alive again. On other occasions, there's no edge. Sometimes you're immersed right in the centre of it. And this is a project that we did for Maggie Centre. Now, the Maggie Centres are a group of buildings um, which give support to people and families who have people who are suffering from cancer. And this was a site that was given to us um, next to Southampton Hospital. And the site is this um, magenta box you see down here. You could call it urban. It's in the middle of a car park. So how do we create something here that would take you away from this car park, take you away from the sense that you are in a hospital? And I, our idea here was actually to create a threshold, to create an air of tranquility. Southampton is near the New Forest, and we thought about, well, why don't we bring a part of the New Forest 
could put it down in the car park here and create an edge, a boundary, a threshold that you have to enter through that can encapsulate you and create this area of tranquility. So that's what we've done. We've created this you know, beautiful magic center. It's a small building, but it's put in between this forest. And it's this forest that you need to pass through before you can come to the building. And this is the built thing. And it has a beautiful sedum roof. But also you see that it's a rather simple building. And there are just four walls. But four very important walls. Walls that start from the outside of the building and gradually come in right into the heart. And it's these walls that guide you in. And again, blur that boundary and that edge between inside and outside. And these walls are important, again, you know, in terms of their detail. They're made with porcelain as well, ceramic. And it's this earthly ceramic that is very soft and warm. And it creates this warm, earthly feeling that draws you into the building. And it reflects the daylight and changes with the colour of the sun as it's travelling around you, but also capturing the dappled light from the trees. And then... There are some other areas where there are, you know, the walls of the building, which are sort of the surrounding boxes. And here we clad them with this stainless steel, which is softly beaten, and it reflects the forest around you, and it gives you this illusion that the forest is never-ending. And you're drawn in through the winding pathways into the heart of the building. You know, this communal space, beautifully floodlit, but then there are areas which are off to the side and they're much more intimate. But these intimate areas still have that echo of the warmth of the ceramics, but also that deep connection with the landscape that surrounds you. There are other occasions where you're much more lucky. Here, we're embedded in a completely natural environment. This is actually a competition that we've just won recently, a couple of months ago, and it's for the design of the new Belgrade Philharmonic Concert Hall in Serbia. And it's located in the middle of a park in the centre of Belgrade. The park, unfortunately, at the moment doesn't quite look as lush as this. It's a bit unloved and uncared for and a bit dry. But we want to use the building as a catalyst that will begin to enable us to completely reinvigorate the natural landscape that surrounds it. But the site is also really important. Like I said, it's actually at the centre of Belgrade. And Belgrade is also at a confluence of east and west between Vienna and Istanbul. But it's also in this exact location, the birthplace of the Vinci people. And these were the people that first invented the Western alphabet. And the building itself is made up of four concert venues. An idea is to surround this again, similar to the Maggie Centre, around the communal space. It's a social space which is at the heart of the building, where everybody can come, no matter whether you're coming to see a concert or not. And the way it's been designed is that there is no back to the concert hall. Everything is a front entrance. And so we bring the park as close as we can to the central space through the formation of these four blocks, and we create four entrances that bring the people into the central space. And so you see it here, nestled within its landscape, and a landscape which we want to completely rewild, bring back water and bring back lakes, and so it becomes something that becomes completely self-maintained. But the building form to us is important as well, and it needs to talk about its function internally, the idea of music and the idea of harmony. And so the idea of the harmonic wave that you see, this is reflected in the planning of the concert hall, where we have these soft, gentle curves that respond to it. But also the sweeping of the baton, of the conductor. And you know, this movement is therefore reflected in the way that we sweep the facades as well. And so you see here from the outside the gentle sweeping nature of the facade and how that is reflected within the landscape that surrounds it as well. But each of the entrances as well, 
respond differently to the people that are entering. You have a rather grand entrance where the sweeps open out and greet you as you enter. This is when you're coming from the city. But if you're coming from the park, the entrance is much smaller, much more intimate, and it draws you in into the central space. And of course, the areas where there are podiums, open stages that open out into the park for these wonderful open air festivals. And here, we use the park, the whole park, as an auditorium. And inside, you are connected. You're connected to the landscape that surrounds you. Everywhere that you look, you can see the landscape that surrounds you. But it's also important, in some cases, not always to reveal everything, not always to be bombarded by the landscape, no matter how beautiful it is around you. And so as we ascend up onto the upper foyers, into the auditoriums, we create these moments where you can't see the landscape. We create these moments of pause, these moments of tranquility, these moments of small compression before you enter into the concert hall and it opens back out again. And you're greeted by this deep, rich timber that surrounds the entire concert hall. That again has that sweeping nature that reminds you of the, the conductor and the music and the harmonics. And it's here where you'll be beguiled by the Belgrade Philharmonic. But really, I guess, to conclude, um, for me, this image kind of sums it up. Um, it's a building that sits within the landscape, but it's the landscape that embraces the building. And I think what it demonstrates through all the four projects that I've shown is that with the right level of thinking and with the right type of architecture, you can design buildings that connect, that can break down the edges, break down the boundaries, but also embrace both the urban and the natural setting. Thank you very much.